Bathsheba. I'm sorry I don't have a cooler nickname. I feel a little bit out of place at this point. Also, I feel like I need like more dynamic background music after that last talk. Maybe a rainstorm or something. I'm here with what Matoikos is calling the demoish petting zoo. <laughs> I think I'm going to call it that forever from now on. <laughs> I make sculpture of all possible things. This is an example of sculpture by me. There's a bunch more examples there. You should go over and pet them eventually. And I make it by means of direct metal printing on a 3D printer, which prints metal. I'm not going to talk about how that happens or how you can do that, because I've given that talk a million times and it's really boring. Let's just all posit that there exist 3D metal printers and you can use them and it's not that hard and the technology is basically at this point mature. A piece like this, this is about the size of a golf ball, I go up to about the size of a softball. And this is how it arrives from the factory, so this is completely hands-off. I order it with their antique bronze finish and this is how it comes back. So I'm now completely hands-off in the sculpture department. My credential is that I'm the world's laziest sculptor. And today what I'm going to talk about is symmetry. What all my objects have in common is that they are symmetrical. And what is symmetry? Well, in simple words, symmetry is a cheap trick for making things, for making simple things look complicated. So I'm hoping that will be uh, relevant to your interests. Now, let me see if I can get this thing to actually advance my slideshow, which it is failing to do at this time. Come on. Ahem. Excuse me, please listen to the whole music while I make this thing work. All right. This is how it worked before metal printing. This is actually a bronze casting. I made this thing out of Bondo and took it to a bronze foundry and cast it. Oh my god, it sucked. So I'm just going to run through sort of a you know, weird little survey of things that I have done. This was done in, in laser cut steel and welded together. This is pewter castings. This is a 14 foot tall snow sculpture that was made in Breckenridge, Colorado. Competition snow sculpture rules, no chainsaws. Only hand tools. This is water jet cut glass. This is a picture of a sculpture and its reflection. I've done a lot of small scale objects in silver and other precious metals in the hope of selling them as jewelry. Sometimes I've succeeded. Here are some very tiny stereolithography prints showing about the state of the art and how small you can go with high resolution plastic. That big blue boulder like object is actually a marble. This is a Voronoi network thing. Voronoi networks are everywhere now. These are glass 3D prints. I couldn't bring these because I was coming here on my bike and I probably would have dropped them or something, but you can totally 3D print glass now. The color is not part of the printing process. That was added afterwards. I made a lamp. If you owned this lamp, your bedroom would be exactly this clean. <laughs> it's a really good lamp, if I do say so. I made another lamp. This is a 3D print made on, out of ceramic. You can 3D print ceramic now. The company that does that is right here in Boston. It's Figulo. I made an oil lamp. Because what else would you do if you could 3D print ceramic, right? It's obvious. But basically, what I do is sell 3D metal prints. That's my exciting job. Now, what all these objects which I have just shown you have in common is that they are all symmetrical. What is symmetry? Well, symmetry is when you have an object and you do an operation on it, and after you do that operation, it's the same object. And in 3Space, if you confine yourself to, I'm going to confine myself here to point group symmetries. I'm not going to concern myself with crystallographic lattices, which are objects which are symmetric under translation. When you move them from one place to another, they stay the same. Objects like that are infinite in extent, and therefore they're very difficult to make sculpture of with a finite amount of funding. And you know you have to sell to people with an infinite amount of money, and the whole thing is problematic. So I work with point group symmetries, which is to say finite objects. And the place to start with symmetry is with operations that preserve measurement. And of those, we have rather a small number. There is rotation. You can take an object and turn it. There is reflection. You can transform an object through a plane of reflection. Then there's rotation and reflection, one followed by the other. You can see this is not getting more complicated very fast. You can rotate things, you can reflect them through a plane, or you can rotate them and reflect them, which is called an improper rotation. Another thing you can do with them is the operation called inversion, where when you have a point x, y, z, it goes to minus x, minus y, minus z. So the whole thing kind of gets turned inside out. This is actually not as much fun as it sounds. It amounts to just mirror reflection. We'll get to more interesting inversive symmetries later. 
So what I want to start by doing is pointing out that there are actually not a very large number of ways that an object can be symmetrical in three-dimensional space under these operations. In fact, there are 14 such ways. I am now going to enumerate all of them. And this might be boring for a few seconds, but afterwards you will know every way that an object can be symmetrical in three space. And furthermore, I'm going to give you the benefit of my 20 years of expertise in selling symmetrical objects to people with more money than they know what to do with, and tell you which of these symmetries are the best ones for making simple things look complicated and making people think you're smarter than you actually are. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, there are 14 ways an object can be symmetrical in three space, under rotation, reflection, and improper rotation. Seven of these ways, which are at the top of this diagram, can you see my mouse probably a little bit? Seven of these ways have cardinality, that is to say, they're valid for any n going from 1 to infinity, integer n. And the bottom seven are unique groups. There's, so there's only one of each of these groups, and there's an infinite number of these groups here, but they're all sort of trivially identical. The first one is the one where you have an object that has a single axis of rotation. Basically, it's like a merry-go-round. Another one, I'm putting these in a somewhat arbitrary order. There's no particular order that they come in. There are a million different kinds of notation and nomenclature for describing these, and I'm actually not going to use any of them because I can't remember any of them, and I kind of address all of these symmetry groups as you there. There's only 14. You can know them all personally. And if you want to get married to a system of notation, you totally can, but I've never really found one that I liked. So here's the system that consists of an axis of rotation, shown by this green pole here, and a plane of reflection. So it's like two merry-go-rounds glued together, bottom to bottom. Here's another one with planes of reflection. In this one we have one axis of rotation, and then a whole bunch of planes of reflection which go through that axis. Now you notice in this previous one, the plane of reflection is perpendicular to the axis of rotation. In these ones, the planes of reflection are parallel, or are coincident with the axis of rotation. So here we got a merry-go-round in which the horses are facing each other, rather than all going the same way. And then we can do both of these things at once. We can have planes of reflection that go through the axis of rotation, and another plane of reflection that's perpendicular to it. And when that happens, a bunch of axes of twofold rotation develop around the middle. And unfortunately, you can't avoid having these. Well, actually, maybe you can, but we'll sneak into that later. Now, fourth one, here is an axis of rotation. And now it's combined with an improper plane of reflection. So this plane of reflection is not simply a mirror going from bottom to top. It's a mirror combined with a little rotation. And that means that these forces are now staggered against each other. And this is actually getting a little bit more interesting. You can see that's much nicer than the one that just has a simple plane of reflection. And then here we are with the improper plane of rotation, the plane of, the plane of improper reflection, reflection plus rotation, and we've got all these other planes of reflection. We have the main axis of rotation, and then we have all these little subsidiary twofold axes of rotation. So this is really like more complicated than it's going to be worth. And that's almost all of the n-fold ways of being symmetrical. And then there's one more, and this one is nice because it has no planes of reflection. Can I just say this? Reflection sucks. It is the most boring form of symmetry. Practically everybody you know has a plane of reflection, and you can tell that they all look the same. People are all basically the same kind of thing. Nobody is going to be surprised or interested by reflectional symmetry. It is not a good way to make simple things look interesting because everybody has seen an awful lot of it, and it is completely banal and passe at this time. So here is a type of symmetry in which there is one plane, one axis of rotation, and then no plane of reflection, but all these little axes of twofold rotation. And that's kind of interesting. So that's all of the first seven ways that a thing can be symmetrical in three space. And now we will move on to the five, the seven distinct groups. Now, you probably, most of you know that there are five platonic solids in three space. Although those of you who are tabletop gamers will be familiar with them, there is the tetrahedron, the four-sided die, 
the cube and octahedron, the d6 and d8, and then there are the dodecahedron and icosahedron, or the d12 and d20. Now, I'm putting them in pairs. The tetrahedron is by itself, cube and octahedron have the same symmetry, and icosahedron and dodecahedron also have the same symmetry. So that's only three symmetry groups. So gosh, how do we get seven ways of being symmetrical out of those? Here we go. Here is the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron has a lot of planes of reflection, and it has a bunch of axes of rotation as well. Some of them are twofold, like this one, and some of them are threefold, like that one. Well, that's all well and good, but it's much better if you get rid of the planes of reflection. If you take a tetrahedron and twist all of the corners the same direction, twist them all clockwise or twist them all counterclockwise, all the planes of reflection go away. And now you have an object which has interesting axes of rotational symmetry, threefold and twofold, but no reflectional symmetry. That's getting a little bit chewy. So there are the tetrahedral groups. Now we have the symmetry group that's represented by the cube. Again, it's got lots of axes, axes of rotation, both fourfold and threefold and twofold. I once had a guy come up to me at a conference and say, how many axes of rotation, rotational symmetry does a cube have? And of course I knew the answer, which is 13. That was a test question, though. This guy was seriously trying to find out whether I was a real person. <laughs> Fortunately, I knew the right answer, so I didn't just drop off the face of the earth. <laughs> and now you know the right answer, too. When somebody asks you that question, yes. how many axes of rotational symmetry does a cube have? Snap it out, 13. And it has also all these, these planes of reflection, which make cubes boring. But again, if you take all the corners of a cube and twist them, twist them all the same direction, all the planes of reflection magically go away, and now you have only axes of rotation, and you have a much more interesting symmetrical object. This is starting to look like you could make a sculpture out of it, or possibly a demo-ish object. I wouldn't know anything about that. So that knocks off four of these lower seven groups. Two of them are related to the tetrahedron, and two of them are related to the cube, which has the same symmetry group as the octahedron. And then we get into the dodecahedron. Everybody loves dodecahedron. If you want to sell something, make it in the shape of a dodecahedron. I learned that. <laughs> Again, it's got lots and lots of axes of rotation. I don't know offhand how many, because nobody had ever actually asked me that question. Some of them are threefold, some of them are fivefold, some of them are twofold. And then there are loads and loads of planes of reflection, which make this object dull and boring and really something that you would expect to find on a table anywhere you might happen to go that they play D&D. Again, if you twist all the corners, again, the planes of reflection go away, and you have lots of rotation. These suckers sell. People love this symmetry group. I have many objects over there that have it. It's not my favorite symmetry group. I'll get on to what my favorite one is, but I can tell you people really like this one. Practically anything looks good if you get 60 of them. That's how many things you need to exemplify this and rotate it out this way. So that gets rid of six of them. And then what about this oddball, oddball group here? Well, if you take two tetrahedrons and kind of ram them into each other, one upside down, the other right side up, you take one of them and twist the corners clockwise, and the other one and you twist the corners counterclockwise, you get this really cool group which is called the pyridohedral symmetry. And it has, again, twofold and threefold axes of rotation. And it has some planes of reflection, but it has this nice property, which none of the other groups in this section have, that there's an axis that doesn't go through any planes of reflection, and then there's rotational axes that do go through the planes of reflection. So that makes this group kind of unique among these, this set of groups. More could be done with this. I haven't worked with this group very much, but I think it's quite engaging. There are probably a lot of interesting undiscovered objects right here. So, that's all of the ways that an object can be symmetrical in three space. All of them. We're done. <laughs> now, which ones are the best? Some of them aren't very interesting because they're trivial. Some of them have too much mirror symmetry or like not enough symmetry in the first place and they're just not very interesting. I reject some symmetry groups on the grounds of excess cardinality. Anything that's worth doing with dodecahedral symmetry, if it's really a good idea, cut it down to a tetrahedron. Pretend you're making it simple, and if it still looks interesting, then you have a good idea. So I'm going to discard on first principles all symmetry groups that have either fourfold or fivefold or more than that rotational symmetry on the grounds that if it's a really good idea, you can make it simpler and it will still be a good idea. 
And runner-up for first place is the Pirate Ahedral group, which is actually, as I say, a really good group. I don't happen to have done much with it, but you know, I might live a little while yet. There, there, there's time. I could do another one. Let me get now to my favorite three symmetry groups, which are now ready for their close-up. There are three of them. One of them is the tetrahedral with twisted corners group. It has only rotational axes. It has three-fold and two-fold symmetry, which is not too much. It has the advantage that everybody thinks they understand it. This is the slightly too easy symmetry group. If you make an object that has this symmetry, this was one of the very first geometrical sculptures, I, sculptures that I made. I made this thing and I showed it to a lot of people and after I saw what they said, that's why I decided to go into this business. Because when you make something that has this symmetry group, a lot of people like it. Also, it shouldn't be too pointy. People really like rounded objects. They don't like pointy objects so much because they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the symmetry group that a lot of people like, and <coughs> it has much to recommend it. Here is another symmetry group, which I think is really, really nice. I think this is the best one of all of them, really, both from the point of view of aesthetics and the point of view of sales. It has three two-fold rotational symmetry axes. I'm told that in German, the word for the operation where you take an object and rotate it through 180 degrees is umklappung. So this is the symmetry group that has three operations, and they are the three mutually perpendicular umklappungen. I love that there's a word for this. <laughs> So it's the case of this group where n equals 2, and it's, as I say, it has this lovely abstract symmetry that it consists of the same operation in the three directions of the dimensions. This is a great group. Everybody thinks they understand it at first glance, and then they're like, oh, wait. This thing is actually more complicated than it looks. I've done a bunch of work with it, and I'm, there's a bunch more to do. Practically anything, even if you just look at the way these teardrops are oriented in this sphere, it starts to be interesting. But you know, I've worked with it for a long time. 15 or 20 years is a long time to think about anything. And this is the group that I really settled on as the one that I'm interested in right now. It consists of one two-fold rotational axis and one improper rotation, also two-fold. And this is the one that people look at that and say, is that really symmetrical? I think you should make it more symmetrical. It's very symmetrical. It's totally symmetrical. You just don't understand it because you've never seen this group before. Nothing in nature, and practically nothing artificial that isn't made by me, has this symmetry group. So it's very unfamiliar. Practically anything that's, that's done with this starts to look kind of alien because it lacks reflection, it lacks obvious rotations. It's just hard to understand. So this is an object that has that group. I've taken this rather simple sort of sketch of a tentacle and if you made a row of these, it would be boring. And if you made a ring of these, it would be boring. And if you made a sphere of these, it would be boring. But when you put them through that symmetry operation, suddenly it goes, what? That looks scary. <laughs> or maybe it looks cute. At any rate, it's hard to understand. It's hard to draw from memory. It's hard to wrap your head around. So that's a great example of a way to make a simple thing look complicated and engaging. Here's another object that has the same symmetry group. I got a little bit crazy with it. People don't like this because it's too hard. That's my, that's my reconstruction of their mental state when they don't buy this object. <laughs> so, having described to you now all of the ways that a thing that can be, can be symmetrical in three space, and also told you which ones, which ways of being symmetrical are the best, I want to leave you with a few things to Google and some extensions of this concept of symmetry. First of all, let me introduce one of my favorite classes of geometrical objects, and one which everybody who does geometry art should know about. These are a thing called, get your pencils ready, triply periodic minimal surfaces. I'm sorry for not making a slide that says that, but I didn't. They're called triply because it's in three dimensions. That makes three triply. Periodic, these are all lattice structures. I'm breaking my rule against considering crystallographic lattice symmetries here because these things are so cool that it's worth it. Triply periodic minimal surfaces, which are a class of mathematical logic that does not fit into this margin. But if you Google that, you'll see a lot of things like this, and they are all extremely cool. This is the best one. It's called the gyroid. It was discovered in the early 70s by a guy working for NASA. He just sat down and visualized this thing without the benefit of computer. I shook his hand and gave him a free one made out of metal. It was the least I could do. <laughs> <laughs> it's the very best triply periodic minimal surface, although they're still being discovered. People think about these things as an active area of research. I've done quite a lot with this surface. These are all objects that are based on the gyroid or closely related surfaces. Here's a little sculpture. Here's a big sculpture that somebody paid me $15,000 for. This is a coffee table. 
This is, again, a table lamp. Here's just a, a, a tiling decomposition. Here's a totally other unrelated object. So you can see I've gotten a lot of miles out of this thing. I'm not actually responsible for this, but it is nonetheless cool. The Exploratorium in San Francisco built a huge gyroid that you can climb on. It's somewhere in the Midwest now. It's touring. If you consider scaling operations, when an object is expanded by a certain scale and it remains the same, it is unchanged, then you have an object that's very familiar to most of you, the fractal. So this is a type of symmetry that doesn't preserve measurement, but which is also perfectly valid and a great way to work. If you go into hyperbolic space, everything suddenly gets a lot more interesting. These same types of symmetrical operations, rotation, reflection, inversion, etc., are all perfectly valid in hyperbolic space with the same kinds of rules, except that hyperbolic space is much better than here. You'll probably have noticed that if you're tiling the plane, there are a small number of things that you can tile a plane with. You can use triangles, you can use squares, you can use hexagons. On the hyperbolic plane, you can tile the plane with any damn thing you want. This guy here has tiled a plane in hyperbolic space with sevenfold and triangular polygons. And you can just take any two numbers you want and tessellate them on the plane. And when you get into three space in hyperbolic space, it gets even more cool. You can, for instance, tile hyperbolic three space with dodecahedrons. <laughs> they stack up perfectly neatly. And you can fly through that, and it's way cool. And you should go to this guy's site, which is a good place to start. This guy's real name is Paul, but I think of him as Bugman. He's done a lot of great mathematical art, and he has a terrific collection of links about hyperbolic space. This design is inspired by a sculpture by me. Paul is kind enough to, uh, to spin it that way, and I'm just like, go ahead, go to town, take my idea. You're doing cool things with it, and here who might argue. So that's a good place to look for interesting things to do with symmetry operations. Now, returning to the gyroid, I want to discuss briefly, I don't have good slides for this because I've never told anyone about it, but try to follow the bouncing ball here. If you have a lattice-based object, I'm now going to talk about a kind of symmetry called inversive, which is more interesting than the simple inversion operation that I spoke of before. What I did with this object was to put it through a transformation in which you have your origin, you've got a point, the point is a distance d from the origin, and I'm going to transform that point to distance 1 over d from the origin. So a very simple transformation. Distance goes to 1 over distance. So if you consider the unit sphere, which includes this microphone, and you're putting a lattice through this transformation, close to 0, the lattice blows up. The numbers get very big. You're near 0, 1 over the number becomes infinitely large, and the object gets very expensive as you move away from the unit sphere. Near the unit sphere, there is not much change. Objects that are just inside the unit sphere transform and turn inside out and become objects just outside the unit sphere without changing their size very much. And then when you get far away, of course, the further away you get, well, the closer you get to zero. So as the lattice progresses out into infinity, it gets more and more compressed under this transformation until things get very, very busy near the origin. And of course, finally, the point at infinity translates all the way to zero. So I did that to the gyroidal lattice. And I got an object like this. I whacked out an ellipsoidal chunk of it so you could see it better. And this is a rendering of it in a transparent material so you can see how compressed the lattice becomes at the inside. Obviously, I couldn't get enough resolution to 3D print the lattice all the way to the center, so instead I cut out a sphere and put a light bulb inside. And then you can see that towards the middle here, you have a basically gyroidal kind of object. It hasn't changed very much under this translation. And then towards the outside, you get these rather expensive, bigger lobes. So this is a minimal surface that I downloaded a Mathematica notebook for and generated, the gyroid. It's not like I invented this thing. And then I put it through this, this easy transformation in which d goes to 1 over d. And now everyone thinks I'm a genius because I thought this object up. Mm. That's what symmetry can do for you. <laughs> a guy, I, I printed this thing in glass just to show that it's possible. And then a guy in Italy got a wild hair to make a really big one. And this object has just now been printed. It weighs, I am told, 1,500 kilograms. And they're trying to get it on a plane so that it can go to Vancouver for the Maker Fair there. This, this genius promoter in Vancouver decided to make this thing happen, and now it exists. And gosh, I hope I see it someday. Well, travel budget for me didn't come into the picture. But just to show you that this object is compelling, and I generated it by 
really simple means. I feel kind of guilty that this thing is now famous because it was such a cheap trick. Now this kind of symmetry, inversive symmetry, there's a whole class of math that's grown up around it, which is mostly done by people who have no appreciation for objects or for, for trying to look cool. And one good place to start if you're interested in inversive symmetry and the ways that people use it is with this guy's site. He's done a good deal with it, although as you see, he's working simply with spheres. He's basically decided, I'm just going to do things with spheres, and that's all. You can do this, as you've seen, with any kind of object, and it's just as easy. But this is one place to start your Googling if you're interested in this subject. Again, the math is so easy. It is a shame people don't do more with this. For completeness, I must mention that you probably all know this, but you can go into dimensions higher than three. In four dimensions, everything is suddenly much better than in three dimensions. One main reason for this is that in four dimensions, there are actually six platonic solids instead of five. So you have the same five, and then you have another one. How cool is that? If you take a four-dimensional object, this is a hypercube, which is quite familiar to you, and this is probably fairly familiar to you also. If you rotate the object in four dimensions and continue projecting it into three dimensions, it performs very interesting transformations, which are not computationally intensive. Of course, if you get into more complicated four-dimensional objects, this is a four-dimensional dodecahedron, things, things get more, I won't, I won't say they get more interesting, but they certainly impress the rubes better. Everyone loves a dodecahedron. And you know, you can have hyperbolic space in four dimensions too. Just say it. <laughs> so that's my talk. This is my site. And if you should wish to see any of the slides from this talk again, I have uploaded them all to this URL. So you can view this slideshow again and imagine my melodious voice at your viewing pleasure. Thank you.